My friends actually joke to me and they're like, you know, five years ago, we couldn't even say Jesus in front of you. Now you're like one of the most famous gays in South Africa. How did that happen? I was outed when I was 19 to my family because my family is really, really Christian. It did not go very well. And so I went back into the closet. Making sure that Nakaina stays on the straight and narrow, as we called it, happened for about five years. To the point where I started preaching. I mean, I, I preached a couple of times, once or twice, to a congregation about how I was an example of how to quell your desires, you know, your wrong desires. I remember before going up to the podium, breaking down and crying, not out of sadness, but out of appreciation of what God had, you know, had given me. God had given me this responsibility to take people who are astray and bring them to the light. I had started to have doubts. I had gone to university and I was studying African literature. When I was alone, I didn't read my Bible. I didn't know whether the God that I've been praying to was there. Well, my life fell apart, and sometimes that really helps. It doesn't feel good at the time, but I remember I was 25 years old, I just recorded my first album, and I was homeless. I found myself with a backpack full of books and CDs, and I was living in couches of friends. A few months later, when I went to speak to my mom, who is still a very conservative Christian, I said to her, you know, in the queer community, we have this thing called the chosen family. And she said, oh, okay, what is that? What we do is that we go out there and normally we're taken care of by people who perhaps went through the same things and we find people who are like-minded and we take care of each other. We, we call that the chosen family. And she said, all I know is that you're my son and I had to choose to love you as you are, even though I disagree with some of the decisions you made. And that's where our relationship is. We still argue about the Bible. And we still argue about certain choices I make. But I know that there's love there. There's a song in my album called Presbyteria where I say, you always meant so well, didn't you? It's a simple line, and it's not, it's not the most poetic line I've ever written, but it's one of my favorites where I go, okay, you were doing your best. We might disagree. We don't have to be friends, but I would like to see things from your point of view and have some sort of compassion. If people get anything from this album, it's that, that empathy is possible, even though you disagree with people. I always make this little speech in my live show, this monologue where I say, this is your moment to be the version that you always wanted to be, but can't be and you're free to do that now because we are all in the dark the only person who has any light on them is me i want people to understand that visibility is really 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 important when i was 19 years old i discovered james baldwin even when i was alone and isolated and i felt alienated from the world and i wanted to die there was still James Baldwin, who was long dead by then. But if there was James Baldwin, then there must be someone else who's alive today who's like James Baldwin. Which means that if there's that person, then there's another person who's less famous. Maybe there's another person down the street who looks like me. Always remember that there's someone out there who's going through exactly the same thing as you are. And for me, that's what art reminded me of. Hey guys, I'm Hunter, the creator and producer of Scene. Thank you so much for watching this episode. It's such an important time to be spotlighting the game changers in the arts and entertainment. If you want to binge some more episodes with maybe a bag of potato chips or something, please like and subscribe down below. Bye.